Um, these forms of transportation in Philadelphia, commonly known as taxi, taxi cab and limousine services, consist of 1,600 medallion taxi cabs, a dozen or so taxi cab dispatch companies, and six partial rights companies, a uh, total of about 175 ta taxi cabs, uh, which operate primarily in specifically authorized peripheral sections of the city. Uh, the authority also regulates about 100 luxury limousine and airport transfer companies, um, running an, an approximate total of 900 vehicles. Uh, the authority's TLD also registers medallion and other company brokers and maintains careful oversight of all company service right sales transactions to ensure service authorized by statute is assumed by qualified entities and operates uninter uninterrupted. Um, we have approximately 70 to 90 new applicants for taxi cab driver certification per week and 60 applicants for limousine driver certificates, um, all of which must have criminal background checks and driver's records checks performed by TLD staff through the Pennsylvania State Police and PennDOT um, respectively. Um, taxi cab driver applicants are required to attend mandatory four-day in-house administered training class. Uh, applicants for both taxi and limousine driver certificates receive certificates qualifying them for uh, only after passing a T TLD um, electronically administered test uh, with a score of 70 percent or higher. There are approximately current, currently there are approximately 3,750 drivers, um, active drivers. The TLD's enforcement department, which includes driver training in its purview, employs set 11 inspectors and is overseen by former Philadelphia Police Lieutenant William Schmidt. Staffed with four mechanics, the, the department also conducts biannual wheels off inspection of all taxi cabs and once every four years inspection of all limousines. Um, at the TLD's own site, which is a lift and emissions equipped facility, which is certified by uh, as a Pennsylvania State Inspection Station. From the beginning, the TLD, TLD was given very strong towing and impoundment enforcement powers, which were only enhanced over the years since then um, with successive legislative amendments and um, promulgation of new regulations. <clears throat> These rules were more often requested by and embraced by um, rather than opposed by industry members as tools to control unauthorized or illegal service uh, providers who set up shop in Philadelphia with no prior vetting, um, as described above, formally described as uh, hacks, gypsy cabs. Um, this category of service provider now includes such monikers as uh, by not only us as regulators, but regulators all over the country um, as rogue apps. Um, hacks with apps and rideshare apps generally. Um, whatever the name, the result tends to be the same, uh, which is unauthorized service providers uh, encroaching upon service territories of legislatively authorized government vetted carriers with unvetted and often inadequately insured, uninspected, and untrained drivers and vehicles. Um, unlike many other major U.S. cities, Philadelphia has been successful at keeping the so-called rideshare apps uh, companies uh, such as Sidecar and Lyft, out of operation in, in Philadelphia due to our aforementioned strong um, enforcement powers. Uh, initial foray, foray by Uber offering its earliest brand of service now called Uber Black uh, was similarly shut down until limousine rights were ap appropriately applied for by the company. Um, a tariff allowing for reservation by internet sm smartphone app negotiated with them and a certificate of public convenience granted for a company using uh, this app. Contrary to those who might refer to the, the parking authority's hard-nosed stance and against illegally operating transportation apps as reflective of an anti-innovation proclivity where transportation technology is concerned, recall that Philadelphia was the first to mandate across the board installation of what is re referred to in our regulations as the meter system, but is actually more of a comprehensive taxicab technology system um, installed in all medallion taxi cabs, with, which is GPS enabled, um, provides turn by turn navigation assistance to the drivers, and affords TLD personnel the opportunity to track every trip based on just a bit of information recalled um, by a passenger. Um, you know, if that passenger did not receive a, a receipt. Um, we know which driver is in which vehicle at any given time, 24 7, um, and have the wherewithal to shut down the cab. Uh, basically, uh, if, if we need to, and call the driver in. Um, all medallion taxi cabs must be equipped with credit card processing equipment, and drivers are, re are required to accept credit cards in payment for their services. 
Um, the system also provides each dispatcher with the means to text calls for service to the closest available cabs, cab and uh, provides provided uh, for full automation um, of what uh, was formerly a paper-based and um, just radio-based system. <clears throat> While the system continues to serve the traveling public and the industry and uh, as well as the TLD uh, very well, we realize that uh, technology has advanced since we first installed this in 2006, 2007, um, and is available, which we can build upon um, an already uh, uh, good system. Uh, the authorities TLD has a uh, already approved for use one ePay app called Way to Ride, which allows users to download their credit card information and tipping preferences uh, to their smartphones and pay for their fare in 1,400 of uh, Philadelphia's 1,600 medallion taxi cabs. App users only need tap to tap the passenger information monitor in the back seat before they leave the taxi at the end of the trip and their fare is paid for. Um, all transactions are secure, reflect only the publicly approved tariff, um, are transparent and available for investigative purposes to TLD enforcement in case of disputes. Um, Verifone, which has developed the app, is actually currently uh, testing a uh, e-hail component uh, counterpart to the ePay app, which will basically put together an app that is very, very much like Uber's, which um, would have all the functionality that that has. Um, meaning you can look at your smartphone, see when your vehicle is come, you know, pulling up or see it where it is on the screen um, on its way to you. Um, um, pared down versions of this app are, are uh, of the e-hail component are actually already available in, in many of the cabs in Philadelphia. Um, there are a number of other such taxicab centric e-hail and e-pay app companies that are designed to work with regulatory bodies to provide all the convenience one might associate with one of the illegal uh, smartphone app companies, but afford the safety and security of government vetted drivers and vehicles using a standard rate of fare. At least a few of these companies started off offering service in jurisdictions without approaching taxicab regulators illegally, but have since become very profitable enterprises working in compliance with the existing statutes or ordinances of uh, jurisdictions throughout the country. The authority was, has successfully promulgated five new sets of regulations over the past uh, year, of which three of uh, our particular importance to the safety and security and quality of, um, uh, of the quality of life of Philadelphia's traveling public and those who work to provide that transportation. Wheelchair accessible vehicle taxi cab, a wheelchair accessible taxi cab program um, was actually approved and will be um, implemented over the next three months, three, four months before the end of the year, um, along with uh, a uh, regulation allowing for medallion sales um, and also a, a, a camera regulation which will have safety cameras installed in all taxicabs before the end of the year. Uh, the WAVE taxicab uh, program uh, will be authorizing 15 additional uh, medallions each year over the next seven years for a grand total of 150 wheelchair accessible taxicabs by uh, 2021. Um, and I would think that you would not find any of these um, accommodations in any of the, or safety measures for that matter, in evidence in any of the aforementioned illegal ride sharing apps. Um, in some, what, everyone, what, I, what we think everyone should realize is that the only thing new when considering uh, this issue of, of the so called uh, TNCs is the new means of communication uh, between the person who needs a ride between point A and point B and the person who can provide that, provide that ride. Uh, the models for various forms and levels of call or demand and for hire transportation have been in, in existence for many, many years. These model, models can essentially remain intact with their various levels of service and uh, associated pricing levels and have the new technology applied to them and to provide the traveling public with the updated level of convenience that they now crave. Um, before closing, I also wanted to state that um, it is the authority's recommendations that recommendation um, that any legislation dealing with uh, regulating uh, these TNCs in Pennsylvania not only prohibit them from operating in Philadelphia, but um, perhaps from the entire Philadelphia region, um, comprised of Delaware, Chester, Montgomery, and Bucks counties. Um, this, not, this area 
um, is served pretty extensively by county cabs that are regulated by the Public Utility Commission, as well as the partial rights cabs that are basically co-regulated by the PUC and the PPA. Um, but the area also is extensively served by the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority um, with regional rail, bus lines, uh, subway, um, you know, you have it. Um, um, so that's just our recommendation at this point. Um, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Commissioner's questions? Sure. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Brown for purposes of questions. Commissioner Brown. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. The only question I have, I, I heard you in your testimony say that uh, Uber Black has filed their application and they operate in, the, in your area in terms of the Philadelphia Parking Authority's area. Yes. Were there any other applications that were filed from other, any, any other TNCs? No. No. Okay. There we're not. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Colley. I'm just curious whether you are aware of any studies on the requirement, uh, the need requirement or the geographic requirement that, that generally applies to certificates. Are you aware of any studies of, of, the, of, of either of those, stud, those, uh, those requirements that would guide us on whether we should keep the need requirement or whether we should grant certificates statewide? Um, I'm not aware of the studies. <clears throat> and we don't actually use need as a requirement for granting limousine certificates um, at the parking authority for for Philadelphia. Um, you, you don't use need, but what do you, what, what what's the chief criterion uh, that uh, it's just simply in the public interest? Public interest, and we believe that the market will regulate itself uh, in terms of. Um, you know, if, if a carrier wants to to actually put themselves out there for service and believes they can do that, they are welcome to apply. Um, we, you know, post the application in the Pennsylvania Bulletin um, and allow for a period of protests. Um, and if there are no protests, uh, the application is granted as long as they meet all the other criteria. Mm. Uh, did you say uh, Uber or or Lyft uh, be started to, to serve in your territory? Uber Uber has been uh, has a limousine certificate. Well, that I, they, I know they have that, but did they try their regular service with you? They did, they did, and this not the not the Uber X, but initially the, what they now call Uber Black. Um, okay. They started to operate. They started. They basically approached. Um, certificate holder, limousine certificate holders, and uh, worked out deals with them, unbeknownst to us, and started offering service. My enforcement guys downloaded the app and used it um, in enforcement stings and impounded several vehicles. You, you what? And impounded several you vehicles, um, towed and impounded uh, several of the vehicles, uh, which basically stopped them in their tracks, um, after which a period of time she went back and forth through, you know, the, our hearing officer and court and that type of thing. Um, they uh, filed for a limousine application, and we worked out a uh, mm -hmm. uh, an acceptable tariff. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmer. Um, <clears throat> I've had your testimony ahead of time, so while I apologize for being late, I was able to read it. Um, one, just just a couple of uh, comments. You talk about uh, you know the, all the the cabs being equipped with GPS, and uh, I can tell you that I've won an overall comment. That I think the uh, taxi cabs in Philadelphia, uh, under the jurisdiction of the parking authority, really do run pretty pretty good overall. Thank you. Um, however, I have had drivers utilizing GPS still get completely lost and taken me, you know, twenty half an hour out of my way. Right. Fortunately, I was. You know, had some landmarks in mind, and I even, I even said, I think you're going the wrong way, and they said, no, 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 but <clears throat> be that as it may. Did you file a complaint? Uh, no, I did not. I did not. And I thought, you know, th there's sometimes you just, you decide that, uh, you know, you just leave things well enough alone. <laughs> that was one of them. Um, <clears throat> The app that you're talking about, that uh, the, the e the uh, what is it called now? 
that you have in the the Verifone. Uh, the wait, wait to ride the. You, you don't you don't get the uh, rate ahead of time. You only get the the email after, right? You, you're talking about wait to ride. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean you basically it's 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 essentially it's not it does not include any e hail function, which can be really defined as the type of app where you can actually stand on the street corner and hit the app and a, a cab will be summoned, you know, And are you contemplating? You. This is just for basically paying for the app, uh, paying for the uh, cab ride for the, for the cab that you select so or the, that you hail. So the e-hail. Or dispatch or, or, or accept by dispatch. I'm sorry. Okay. So, so you're not going to be able to um, tell the individual once they indicate through that e-hail process um, where they want to go that you're going to be able to tell them what they're going to pay. Just what they're, uh, it's essentially for the, at this point, it's what they're, um, what they're, what you, you pay with that. And it's not telling you up front uh, any of that information. When they present their second phase uh, of the app, we call the e-hail portion, um, you should be able to get that information. Okay. All right. Um, and just for the record, I would not support um, having, giving you, excluding or expanding the authority out to uh, the other counties. Okay. Vice Chairman Coleman. I don't have any questions at this time, Chairman. I'd like to thank Jim for coming and providing testimony. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. I was thinking as much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. And I'll pass along your good wishes to both Vince and to Dennis. Great. Um, well, thank you again for joining us. Uh, no further questions. We'll uh, ask our next panel to get assembled. This is the Transportation Industry Association. We have eight presenters on this panel. What I'd like to um, recommend, Judge Rainey, um, to any one of the panelists is rather than reading all pages of testimony, if you want to give us some of your high level thoughts, but you're more than welcome to read, we won't be offended. But uh, you have the opportunity if you just want to hit on some of your, um, your high level um, remarks in your testimony, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Appreciate it. Okay. That's me. Okay. That's cool. Do we have enough chairs Who's for Mark? the presenters? Who is Mark? All right. Okay, Judge Rainey, okay. turn it back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as the Chairman said, we are going to try to get back on schedule, and we appreciate the assistance of the witnesses in helping us with that. So I will just uh, introduce all of the panelists and uh, then you will proceed with your testimony. So that we have James Campolongo, who's president of the Pennsylvania Taxi Cab and Paratransit Association. We have Alfred Legasse, who is chief executive officer for National Taxi Cab Limousine and Paratransit Association. We have Philip Jagiella, executive director, of the National Limousine Association. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I'm impressed. Thank you, sir. Uh, we also have Jim Salinger, who's president of the Philadelphia Regional Limousine Association. We have Ronald Blount, 
who is or blonde, who is president of the Taxi Workers Alliance of Pennsylvania. We have Alex Friedman, who is president of the Pennsylvania Taxi Cab Association. Mark Saber, who is the Central Penn Taxi Association representative. And we have Dean Bolendorf, who is the president. And also we have Edward Heltman, who is the vice president of the Ambulance Association of Pennsylvania. Please proceed with your testimony in the order that I announced you. Good afternoon. Um, is it your preference that we kind of just summarize this instead of reading it all into, back you, into the you record? Would make our day. I don't know if I can go that fast <laughs> for four minutes, but thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of the Pennsylvania Taxi Cab and Paratransit Association. <clears throat> We're here to talk about the regulatory changes that may come up and whether they're necessary. And the short answer to that from our association is yes, they do. The PTPA recognizes that current technology presents our industry with a tremendous opportunity to provide better service in the communities that our members serve. Implemented the right way, digital dispatch platforms combined with mobile app technology should provide a useful tool for taxi companies looking to expand the availability of taxi cabs and provide more efficient service. That being said, we also recognize the recent history of transportation network companies, TNC's expansion from out of state <clears throat> into states that paints a disturbing picture when multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar companies are ignoring regulatory requirements designed to protect the public from among things as price <clears throat> gouging, inadequate assurance, dangerous drivers, dangerous vehicles, and discrimination. The PTA strongly believes that the PTA can embrace the innovations and avoid the problems of lawless TNCs, provided that we do it in a, in a correct manner. Of course, we will not solve the problems on our face as stated if we fail to describe these problems accurately. Another important step uh, in reforming transportation regulations the right way is to invite input from everyone who is affected by it. The Commission needs to hear from all Pennsylvania taxi cab companies whose livelihoods stand to be hugely affected by the reforms being considered here, especially from the 180 small taxi companies in the Commonwealth. Before rushing to implement new reforms, the Commission should allow for adequate time for public comment, period, and should invite input from all of the small taxi companies that might be destroyed by reforms that fail to give them a fighting chance against much larger companies. I mention these small companies in part because it is clear from the hearings agenda, instead of reforming or improving the need standard and the geographic location authority, you're considering abolishing them completely. Presumably to allow TNCs the freedom to move into and out of whatever market they choose to see fit. If you do that, you need to consider the impact on small rural taxi companies and the passengers <clears throat> that they serve. Eliminating the need scope will, among other things, allow large companies to run roughshod over small companies. Large companies have the capital to move in with non-competitive pricing to affect or wipe out the little guy and take over small markets throughout the Commonwealth. Instead of having regulated price controlled geographic controlled service, which <clears throat> service that service that public interests like other public utilities, you instead create unregulated, straightforward standard oil type monopolies with the problems that they bring. It would be a mistake to assume that TNCs will rush to these small communities to solve the problem. A large portion of small communities, rural taxi businesses depend on service to people, mainly the elderly and those who do not have smartphones, do not have credit cards, who use taxis as an essential part of their daily routine to complete errands, make appointments. These trips typically don't generate much profit. TNCs avoid these customers and instead target the affluent customers who have the required smartphones and credit cards to do this. Healthy competition is welcomed by the PTPA, but no taxi cab company or TNC company should be allowed to pick when they operate, where they operate, and who they operate and who they serve. So if you want TNCs in all communities, especially rural communities, you need to require them to accept all fares, including those less lucrative fares in those communities. Everything else will serve to eliminate transportation services for the elderly, the low income, and those who rely on taxi cab services. In summary, the PTPA welcomes regulatory reform. We only ask that you ensure fair competition between the Pennsylvania taxi cab industry and TNCs, and that you preserve the public service mission of all common carriers throughout the Commonwealth. Thank you very much. Mr. Lagasse. 
Good afternoon. Thank you for um, allowing us to testify today. My name is Al Lagasse. I represent the Taxicab Limousine and Paratransit Association. TLPA is a nonprofit national trade association representing the owners and managers of taxicab, limousine, sedan, airport shuttle, paratransit, and non emergency medical fleets. Our 1,100 members uh, operate more than 100,000 passenger vehicles and transport well over 2 million passengers each day. TLP TLPA believes that unlicensed and therefore illegal operations of so-called transportation network companies such as Uber and Lyft threaten to defranchise the entire for hire vehicle industry and we believe they pose a real danger to public safety and will greatly infringe upon the public's secure, equal, and reliable access to transportation. Allowing companies like Uber and Lyft to operate without oversight and regulation is reckless. These providers initiate and manage transportation services for hundreds or even thousands of individuals each day and use numerous drivers and vehicles to provide transportation service. However, they not only claim to incur, incur no liability uh, for ensuring these drivers and vehicles meet uh, established safety mandates, but they require an indemnification from passengers and drivers for any liability uh, resulting from the service provided. The purported commitments to safety asserted by Lyft and Uber are meaningless as long as they are permitted to operate without oversight and accountability for meeting public safety requirements imposed on all other common carriers. Without accountability, there is no standard or enforcement by which Uber and Lyft would be subject to independent driver background checks and vehicle inspections. They should not be allowed to uh, skirt these important public safety provisions. The Commission's current regulations set minimum insurance coverage requirements on common carriers to ensure that suitable coverage is maintained to protect the driver and the passenger 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. At this time, at least 20 states and the District of Columbia have issued alerts warning consumers of insurance gaps presented by services like UberX and Lyft. The concern arises when a non-commercially licensed driver uses a non-commercially licensed vehicle to provide commercial for hire transportation service. Lyft and Uber like to inflate the degree of support communities have shown to amend their licensing and public safety requirements in order to allow them to operate. In the United States, only two states and fewer than 10 cities have created new regulations for TNCs. Although TNCs have been around for nearly six years, they collectively operate in fewer than 100 U.S. cities compared to the approximately 2,000 communities that have taxi service. In most communities, Uber and Lyft have not been granted authority to operate, and they are being challenged by the city or state leaders uh, for operating without a permit and without meeting full public safety requirements. In conclusion, as the Commission is addressing these commercial carrier issues, we urge you not to act hastily to adopt new rules. Several communities are now experimenting with this regulatory change regarding Uber and Lyft, and the Commission can benefit greatly from observing those regulations and working and, and to see how they're working and what problems they're creating. Regarding the need for regulatory updates, it is TLPA's position that updates may be appropriate but that Lyft and Uber should continue to be subject to taxicab and limousine licensing and public safety requirements. We also believe that to ensure the public safety, Uber and Lyft should be required to come into immediate compliance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lagasse. Mr. Jagiella. Thank you. I welcome this opportunity to sit before you today. I know it was a number of years before. I had the great pleasure of sitting before then Chairman Colley. Uh, when we came before him with some of our concerns with the Philadelphia Parking Authority, he addressed each and every one of them very appropriately and professionally, and we're very thankful for the Commission and what they do to ensure the safety of the public, as is their charter and course. As a previous operator in the limousine industry for over 25 years in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I certainly know how to adhere and uh, subscribe to the rules and regulations that were imposed upon our industry and continuously are and should be for these entities. 
now is the executive director for the National Limousine Association, also a nonprofit association. We represent the owners of companies from around the country and around the globe of over 2,200 members. We have taken a more uh, generic but definitive approach to this uh, challenge that you in Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth, are faced with. We applaud the fact that you are stepping up to the plate and mimic some of those things that have been very successful, much like we've heard about in California. And I have to take and go back to your very statement, trust but verify. Once you adhere to that type of a mantra, you will take and find that there is a lot of uncertainties in what has been spoken to today once you do your due diligence to find out what it is and you do need to exercise the caution and not rush into something that is an unknown or else you will take and suffer the same consequences that have happened around the country. I can also tell you from a personal experience, I have a stepdaughter that goes to American University in Washington, D.C. She subscribes to Uber. It is sacrilege in our household. Her mother tells her that all the time and she knows perfectly well what her rating is because it is up there and she wants to take and have a high rating. So she will not rate those drivers on a less than. She has been lost more times than not. She has three technology devices strapped to her hip at any given time. The only time they don't work is when she's supposed to call her mother. But I can tell you that she knows how to get from point A to point B and she has led many Uber drivers by which to get to that point. That is the only time I will use that name because other than that, that is giving them a commercial break which they are not entitled to unless they are following the rules and regulations that smart organizations, commissions like this, will take and make them subscribe to as well. I also had the great opportunity two weeks ago to sit on the NAIC panel, a National Association of Insurance Commissioners in Kentucky, where Commissioner David Jones moderated the panel. That's why you're seeing such a great thrust of activity on this very sensitive issue. There's a lot of emotion to it, we made and crafted our paper specifically to address it from a more generic, as I said, but broad perspective. On that, the National Limousine Association believes that the underlying purposes for re regulating the passenger transportation industry should be applied in the public interest to all operators of passenger transportation. This includes t transportation network companies. The public and regulatory interaction with TNCs continues to suffer from misperceptions that affect the safety of the public the consumer's rights of the passengers, the fair treatment of TNC drivers, and the fair application of laws towards bona fide operators of passenger transportation. Some TNCs have elected not to uphold the same duties as bona fide passenger transportation operators on the grounds that they are merely providing a web-based application that introduces drivers and passengers. As we heard today, we even hear that they're independent contractors. Well, the question then begs, who is holding them accountable for their record keeping? that they profess that they do. The independent contractor, well, we understand that they're just part-time looking for supplementary income. Do they even have the wherewithal to know what they have to subscribe to? So the NLI has um, put together this paper to take and serve as a guideline and a template for people like yourself to use as a design. Because we asked the question, these TNCs, how do you take and enforce all the regulations that you so diligently work to when you see a personal vehicle providing transportation, you have no idea. The only thing I would say in closing is, I'd like to have an opportunity of a photo op from each and every one of you because I appreciate this opportunity today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salinger. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission. My name is Jim Salinger. I'm here as president of the Philadelphia Regional Limousine Association and Unique Limousine of Harrisburg. I want to thank you for providing us the opportunity to give our views on the important issues you have raised. Philadelphia Regional Limousine Association was founded in 1982 to promote the professional relationship of fellow operators and regulatory agencies while keeping the consumer safety and interest as our main focus. PRLA represents members from Philadelphia region as well as those based in New Jersey, Harrisburg, Sprit, Pittsburgh, Scranton, and other regions of the Commonwealth. After discussing the, with the members of the PRLA, I offer the following comments for consideration by the Commission. At present, the Commission has fairly lenient standards for drivers. We understand that these requirements are designed to cover all segments of the industry. In the limousine business, we hold our drivers to a higher standard than, any, than that for any other segment of the industry. It is our Commission 
it is our opinion the Commission should expand the current standards. The PRLA has filed comment on to the proposed change in Commission regulations which would replace the eight-year-old vehicle age rule with a 200,000 mile rule. I will not comment on the specifics of this proceeding but invite the commissioners to take a look at our comments. I do think that the proposed change does recognize the vast difference between taxi cabs and limousine industry and the commission should be encouraged to recognize these differences. Due to insurance requirements plus the nature of the usage of limousines, a supervised wheels off inspection should be required at different intervals. Further, a review of all of the commission's cosmetic regulations should be undertaken. The very nature of the limousine business, the competitive nature of the business, and the generally higher cost of luxury vehicles that are used by certificated limousine carriers is such that non-safety regulated items are simply not applicable. Of all of the segments of the industry, our services are not a necessity, and the marketplace serves to police our industry. The Commission's regulations must change, be changed to reflect current insurance requirements and cost. Simply stated, the current insurance, cover, insurance requirements for Pennsylvania should be the same as for the interstate transportation. Presently, there is no proof of need for required for new entrance into the limousine business. Personally, however, I believe that unlike limousine service, other segments of the industry are utilized not for special occasions, but on an everyday and should remain subject to the requirement need. For new entrant into the limousine business, there should be some showing that the new entrant is fit to serve, perform the service and that he or she has some support for the establishing of his business. I'm informed by counsel that to eliminate the need standard would necessitate a modification to the PUC code. The current system of regulation was established to protect the public as well as legitimately operating companies in matters of fitness, safety, and tariff charges. Any new entrant, entrant should be held to the same, standard, same existing standards companies and be subject to the rules as a new entrant or as a broker of transportation services. Just as existing carriers must seek approval from the Commission for a change in rates, these companies should not should not be simple should not be able to charge a market rate at the time the service is secured. If they are simply attempting to be a broker or use as a clearinghouse, they should at a minimum be required to utilize only PUC certificated carriers. Enforcement officers should have the authority to seize vehicles of all illegal operators for repeat offenses. In our opinion, there are too few enforcement officers to cover the state. Officers are authorized to seize and impound vehicles for illegal operations, and enfor enforcement officer funding should be increased. Once again, thank you for permitting me to testify. The PRLA is willing to meet with any commission person about personnel to develop changes in the commission transportation regulations and procedures. Thank you. Is that Mr. Saber who is next? Please proceed. Hello, uh, my, name is Mark, my name is Mark Saber. I'm the president of the Center of Pennsylvania Taxi Cab Association. Thank you. Uh, vehicle safety is a topic that is constantly being discussed by coal and demand carriers. In recent years, the Commission has adopted a, a series of regulations that has resulted in a near absolute rule that a vehicles eight or more model years old may not be used in carrier's fleet. The justification for this rule is that vehicle of eight years or more are likely to be unsafe. In reality, age is not a good indicator for the safety of a vehicle. By their very nature, cars are individually unique. Their care, its driver, and the miles on the odometer all play role in a vehicle safety more so than a vehicle age. 
It is, it is the suggestion of the Central Pennsylvania Taxi Cab Association, as well as myself, that instead of relying on a bright line rule that a vehicle be retired and at its ninth birthday, the vehicle should, the vehicle should instead undergo an individual inspection to determine if the vehicle is fit to serve the public. Under section 29.314, the commission requires a time consuming waiver application to allow carrier to continue using vehicle more than eight years, uh, eight model years old. Just acquiring the information to apply for the waiver can take weeks. And if the application is, submi is submitted with the missing information, the commission can deny the whole application as incomplete. After gathering all of the vehicle information, a carrier then submit the application to the commission. Then a person in an office looks at the picture of the vehicle, records of the vehicle, and the reason why the waiver has been requested. This person then makes a determination as to whether inspection of the vehicle is needed without ever having left the office and without so much as test driving the vehicle. The association believes that this process is too costly administrat administ administratively from both the commission and the carrier perspective. We can streamline the entire process if at the required annual inspection, which all certificated carriers are required to undergo cars that are older than eight, year, eight model years undergo a special inspection by the Bureau of Enforcement. This would be a wheel of inspection that would allow the highly trained inspectors to which the, the, the PUC enforcement officers, they are, equi they are equipped with a, a safety inspection license. They know about the car, they know about the safety procedure to directly inspect the vehicles with other mechanics that certified as well. At the end of the inspection, the vehicle could then be deemed safe and entitled to a waiver or unsafe and taken out of service. And also zero defect. If there is any problem with the car, the car should be taken. It's one chance the commission should give it to, to the carrier. If any defect in the car, even if it's a light bulb, the car should be out of service. The association suggests that prior to the annual inspection, each carrier be required to provide a list of all vehicles that will reach their eight model years as of January 1st of the subsequent year, at least six weeks prior to the annual inspection and will only include vehicles that the carrier wishes to continue to use in its fleet. The wheel of inspection will be in addition to any inspection done as part of the traditional inspection, such as the yearly inspection is conducted by the Bureau of Enforcement and also the random inspection that is, is can be conducted at any given mo moment by uh, the, the, the Bureau of Enforcement. To make this change happen, the association process processes the following language change to vehicle list. During the first quarter of each calendar year, carrier shall provide the commission with current list of all vehicles utilized under its call or demand authority, which will exceed eight model years old during the succeeding 12 month, the months. This must contain the year, make, vehicle identification number, current odometer, reading, and registration number for each vehicle. The list shall be mailed to the Commission Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement. The Commission has acknowledged that the age of a vehicle is not necessarily accurate depiction of its safety for vehicle and in limousine service. The association suggests that the use of age as a sole factor for getting rid of vehicles in a fleet does not reflect the safety of a vehicle. Age alone does not take into account the varying condition taxi vehicles operate 
in nor does it take into account consistent routine maintenance. The association has proposed an alternative procedure which would relieve an administrative burden on the commission, promote efficiency, decrease costs to both commission and carriers, and ensure safety is not compromised. The bright line rule takes away the, the, the discretion of the commission but also the carriers who makes daily business decision to determine when it is appropriate to retire vehicle. Of course, each operator would be thrilled to generate enough money to replace an entire fleet every year. However, given the declining economy and readership, this is totally unrealistic. We also hear testimony today regarding transportation network companies. Such a companies are nothing more like uh, Uber and Lyft. Such a companies are nothing more than a common carriers in service. The use of some kind of, of, of apps based technology to gather rides does not make TNS exempt from being call or demand service. Using an app is not new nor novel. And when TNS companies apply for experimental service, they are doing nothing more than attempting to go around the authority of the commission. The only feature that separates TNS from call or demand service is that TNS does not use a meter. They use an arbitrarily derived fear. And because of this, they are dangerous to the public interest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blau. Good, good, good afternoon, good afternoon. My name is Ronald Blunt, and I began driving a cab in Philadelphia in 1983. My comments are as follow. On behalf of the 1,200 members of the Taxi Workers Alliance of Pennsylvania, we wish to submit our comments concerning concerning the harm to drivers and customers of not properly regulating transportation network companies. Taxi drivers are some of the most vulnerable workers in Pennsylvania. Many of us work 12 to 12 hours a day, six days a week, and are still raising our families in poverty. The, PP, the PUC, I'm sorry, the PUC, through its powers to regulate fares, set the maximum number of active vehicles, regulate lease caps, has almost total control of, over what a driver can make. The same argument that mandates the government setting a minimum wage so that workers do not have to live in poverty obligates the PUC to regulate the industry so that taxi drivers also do, do not live in poverty. The evidence suggests that giving up control over the number of vehicles and affairs to TNC will, will decrease drivers' income for both taxi drivers and TNC drivers far below the, the minimum wage. Deregulate, um, excuse me, each of the, um, so I want to go over, over the history of deregulation in the taxi industry. Our claim that fare wars and unregulated number of drivers is harmful to drivers and passengers is based on past experience. This has, there have been four prominent waves of fare wars of, and unregulated numbers of taxis in the U.S. These occurred during the Great Depression when thousands of the unemployed became taxi drivers. After World War II, when thousands of returning vets did, did the same, often in violation of the laws like the TNCs of today. During the 1980s, when many cities deregulated their taxi industries with disastrous results, and today with TNC companies injecting unlimited number of drivers and fare wars into the system. Each of the previous waves of, waves of drivers and fare chaos ended the same way with escalation of prices, decrease in driver's earnings, unsafe conditions for consumers, aggressive solicitation, and finally, drivers exiting the industry. For example, during the Great Depression, New York had over 30,000 taxi drivers, far more than passengers. Drivers had to work longer hours and to reduce their fares in order to scrape together a living. The public became concerned about the aggressiveness of drivers and the integrity of vehicles. In 1937, the mayor signed the Haas Act that limited the number of taxi cabs on the street. This model was replicated across the country, creating either a medallion system or a franchise model. 
Since then, taxi regulation has often served the interests of the taxi companies and has been harmful to drivers and passengers. But the way to fix this is to better regulations, not, to, not with no regulations. The entry of UberX and other TNCs into the taxi market eerily reproduces the 1970s and 80s failed experiments to deregulate the taxi fares and the maximum number of cars. Dr. Paul Dempsey has compiled the results of such tech, uh, taxi deregulations for 21 major U.S. cities prior to 1983, showing, one, a significant increase in the number of active drivers competing for a fixed number of fares, two, an increase in highway congestion, in energy consumption, and environment pollution, three, increase in, in rates, four, decline in drivers' income, and five, deterioration in, in, in service. Most cities returned to reg regulated markets within a few years. For example, in 1979, Seattle deregulated the taxi industry by lifting all caps and allowing taxis to set their own rates. The presumption was that it would improve service and reduce fares. What actually happened was the opposite. The service declined and rates increased. In 1984, Seattle re-regulated the taxi industry as did other cities that tried this experimental model. St. Louis deregulated resulted in a 35% meter increase. Taxi companies raising their rents on drivers to offset lost revenues due to competition and a constant overturning of its drivers. In, 19, in 2002, St. Louis also re-regulated the industry. In the, in the 1970s, other cities such as San Diego, Sacramento, Phoenix, Kansas City, and many others had tried deregulations of their taxi industry only to return to regulating them for consumer protection, steady rates, and to end aggressive solicitation. The impact of TNCs on customer access, UberX, Lyft, Sidecar, and other ride selling applications have been around for a few years. So there is some history on their impact on customers' access to transportation. According to Mark Vruberg, head of the San Francisco United Taxi Workers, one third of the taxi fleet remained dormant during the weekdays. You might think as, you might think as a full-time driver's leave, they, they are replaced by, uh, by full-time TNC drivers who are covering the same areas at the same time, but that is not the case. Drivers tell us that part-time UberX and Lyft drivers who drive only around rush hours take fares from full-time drivers who rely upon rush hour fares to allow them to dr drive the rest of the day. For example, like drivers, there are slow parts of the day for a taxi driver. They, they come out during the morning rush, there's a rush hour, they make their lease, I mean, they can make a living. And then it slows down from 10 to about maybe 3 p.m. and it picks up again from 3 to maybe about 7. So if the UberX drivers are, and, and the TNC drivers are coming out during those, those, those periods, then those, the, the regular full-time drivers can't make a living. They can't afford to stay out there and take people to the doctors or handling government contracts and stuff like that. So we think that, that, that that's really important. Five years ago, if a driver was to use his or personal car to transport people around, around Philadelphia, I take my private car and I just go in the corner taking people around, I will be considered a, an illegal hack. But when a billion dollar venture does it, it is considered innovative, smart, and the future of transportation. But what kind of future are we talking about? The TNC set fares without any driver's input or regulation. They set the number of drivers. They set the fees and commission charged to drivers. Drivers have no recourse if, if they are unjustly unsubscribed from the app. TNC are companies with 19th century labor relations hiding behind their 21st century smartphone apps. How can drivers who are already struggling compete against an entity that has no medallion leasing fee to pay, insurance requirement, or other fees? The PUC has a clear definition of what a taxi cab is. The TNC provides both dispatch and vehicle to the customer. They, they describe themselves as a ride-sharing company, but in reality, they provide ride selling to the service to the drivers, who in turn provide taxi cab service to the public. They should be regulated exactly the same way as taxi cabs. TNC, TNCs engage in price surging and follow no set turf in violations of, of PUC regulations. On demand days, many citizens will pay enormous amounts of money as TNC profiteer on their service. Insurance coverage is also precarious <coughs> as, as precarious as people simply do not know if there, they, if there is any legitimate insurance coverage. 
Most insurance companies will not cover personal vehicles doing commercial work, and TNC insurance will not cover vehicles unless they're en route or doing a trip. I'm almost finished. Um, okay. Okay. So what, ha so what happens when there's an accident involving a pedestrian or a bicycle, bi bi bicyclist? Deregulating the number of for hire vehicles on Pennsylvania streets will increase vehicle coll collisions, increase pollution, and add to congestion. Taxi drivers will be replaced with amateur drivers, putting people further at risk. Lastly, as seen in previous deregulation attempts, both TNC and taxi drivers will become more aggressive in soliciting work. Vehicle quality will diminish, and prices to customer will dr dramatically fluctuate. Taxi driving will become a part-time job because no one will be able to make a full-time living at it. This prediction doesn't come from us. It comes from the TNC themselves. Uber as a limousine company registered with the taxi regulator has proven to be beneficial to the citizens of Pennsylvania. Their drivers are vetted, vehicles carry the required insurance, and are inspected regularly and their prices are required to be above what a taxi cab would charge. All of these requirements meet PUC standards. What we would only add that like, 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 like the medallion and franchise taxi cabs, that their number be capped. As with other limousines and taxi cab companies, TNC should be required to submit and follow a steady tariff, no price surging. TNC drivers' partners must be covered by unambiguous insurance coverage, meaning state requirements, as soon as the driver turns on the app. The Taxi Workers Alliance supports TNC in the limousine format described above with the added re regulations. TNC in the taxi cab format will, will create a situation of deregulating of the taxi industry, followed by a severe crisis of both TNC and taxi drivers, bottom line, a race to the bottom. The PUC should, uh, that's it, that's it, that's, that's enough. But um, thank you guys for allowing me to, allowing me to talk, okay? <laughs> thank you, Mr. Okay. Blood. Mr. Freeman. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, commissioners, chairman, vice chairman. Uh, it's very difficult for me to add something after six people already expressed um, the majority of the concerns for the industry and for this panel. Uh, I would suggest that you will read my testimony, my written testimony, so I will just speak out of the issues that uh, really were brought in earlier in concern of the commissioners. First of all, I would like to concur with the opinion of uh, Chair, uh, Commissioner Crowley that TNCs are not right sharing services, period. They are kind of entities that are made to make money, and huge money. Secondly, I would like to reiterate the issue that taxi cab industry are not a conglomerate, are not a monopoly, are not uh, something of uh, mafioso type operation. In reality, we are much, much smaller entity than $18 billion company that is trying to smear our reputation in the papers and publications. I would like to state that we are not against technology. We are not anti-innovation. In a matter of fact, in 2005, when nobody even knew about entities like Uber and Lyft, City of Philadelphia introduced digitized dispatch system. The credit cards machines were installed in taxi cabs. The uh, communication modems were installed. The GPS systems were introduced we were able to get our orders through emails, through phone calls, and lately we introduced our own smartphone application called 215 Get a Cab. 215 Get a Cab is different than UberX and Lyft application. 
215 get a cab employed in licensed taxi cabs in Philadelphia. And by meaning license, each and every cab is insured, each and every cab is inspected, each and every cab is operated by independent contractor. Those independent drivers are exactly those drivers that everybody is talking on the, uh, operating on the, week, on the weekend and other times. The 80% of the vehicles belongs to those drivers. 80% of the vehicles belong to those drivers. They are utilizing them when they are going to supermarkets, taking their kids to school, and so on and so on. And the free time, because they are independent contractors, they are employing them as a taxi cab with no insurance lapses. I was troubled by reading uh, the emergency order the same way you, Commissioner Crowley, did. When I check on e-form was filed with Public Utility Commission, e-form was filed in Uber and Lyft name. However, there is no insurance card, no insurance ID cards in any of those vehicles that are operating on the street. That is obviously a big insurance gap, an oversight gap in, in, in this uh, permitting them to operate with, with this kind of insurance. They only carry their personal insurance in the car. So who is responsible? Is the general public responsible for uh, having uh, coverages and their premiums raised due to uh, Uber and Lyft uh, lapses? What about if you carry two applications in the same private vehicle? Who is responsible for the accident when the accident happened? Uber, Lyft, sidecar? I don't know. Do you know? I don't know. So my question is, why don't they register each and every private citizen vehicle into their company and have them insure according to your rules and regulations so they address the issue of the insurance? Now, my question is as well, how does enforcement identifies those vehicles on the street. There is no way enforcement can go twice without his phone being disconnected, smartphone being disconnected, so they are not e even able to call UberX or Lyft to, to see how they operate. There is no way they can do it without a special uh, PennDOT tag, like taxi cabs do, like limousine operators do. I testified for two days on the hearing in front of administrative judges at the, uh, in the hearing in Pittsburgh, and I couldn't Mr. find... I'm sorry, I, I just want to admonish you not to go into matters that are okay. currently pending before the commission. Okay, I'm sorry. My point is, there is nothing new in this technology. Our customers are able to dial the phone in a conventional way. Our customers are able to get a email reservation, advanced reservation. Our customers never charge for cancellations like Uber and Lyft customers do. Our customers are paying according to the meter approved meter and tariffs rates. Why is Uber and Lyft allowed to charge whatever they want? What, why are they pretending that they are a ride-sharing company where there is nothing incidental about ride-sharing in this situation? I'm, I, I would suggest for this commission to take closely at the State Representative Killian Bill 2445 to make sure all those issues are addressed, 
to make sure all those issues are oversighted and, and properly reviewed. I appreciate your support, and I'm also Eagles fan, and let's go Eagles. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Friedman. <laughs> Next we have Mr. Bolendor. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, address this uh, commission um, on behalf of the Ambulance Association of Pennsylvania. Um, I will not be commenting on TNCs, Uber, or Lyft. If you allow me to talk about other things, I appreciate it. Um, we are um, an organization of about 250 EMS agencies representing um, for-profit, not-for-profit, municipal, fire-based, hospital-based, as well as air ambulance throughout the Commonwealth. 20 years ago, um, air ambulance services were really not engaged in a great deal of wheelchair van or paratransit type activity, but uh, a great deal has changed in the healthcare delivery system and uh, payer policies um, have really dictated how often we are now seeing patients push down to a lower mode of medical transportation, which uh, don't necessarily qualify for ambulance coverage. So we have a lot of issues right now because we're um, regulated by the Department of Health. We're licensed by the Department of Health as an EMS agency. Um, our vehicles are inspected by the DOH. The band-aids are counted. The insurance is verified, et cetera. We are also, in many cases, um, under the jurisdiction of the PUC if we choose to uh, provide wheelchair van services to our patients who are in skilled nursing facilities or hospitals. Um, this is um, an area of concern for us because in, in the time, at the time when the um, exemption was created, the so-called Policy Statement 4111, which uh, attempted, I think was an attempt by the PUC to look at the ill and injured criteria or exemption and try and develop uh, some guidance for the industry um, should they choose to be exempt from the PUC. There are certain criteria that would have to be met. The, um, the criteria basically says now, at least in the um, um, proposed ex exemption uh, statement, that you must have two people on board um, a wheelchair van, one of whom is an emergency medical technician. You have to have basic life support equipment and oxygen. So essentially, what the PUC is saying is you have to put these items and trained personnel on board in anticipation of taking care of a patient. Um, the problem with that language now is in 2009, Act 37 was passed, which is the Emergency Medical Systems Act. And there's a definition of a patient in the Act which stipulates that if a patient, if, uh, an individual requires medical monitoring, treatment, or observation, then that person has to be transported by an EMS agency. So this puts us in conflict that if we're going to try and meet the exemption of the PUC's uh, criteria of having two people on board and all this equipment, suddenly we're operating an illegal ambulance. So we've actually had uh, dialogue at a lower level within the Public Utility Commission just on the, on the concept of maybe the ambulance industry or medical transportation is not a great fit now for the PUC. Maybe it really, it really belongs under the Department of Health. Um, other states like New Jersey have that similar model where the Department of Health actually licenses ambulances and wheelchair vans at the same time. Um, this is something that we're asking for some open-mindedness from the commission. As this develops, we're going to be pushing in this direction. We think that the ambulance industry who provides medical transportation is a better fit under the Department of Health rather than the PUC. And there's lots of reasons for that, um, HIPAA violations, um, um, Anytime a patient has any type of infectious disease, you know, you, you need to use universal precautions. Uh, folks in the paratransit industry are not trained in those types of areas. So uh, this is more of a medical transportation carve-out or specialty that we're looking at. So that's the kinds of things that we need help with uh, from the commission. We think that uh, this is, uh, we're in an evolving system. Obviously, everything we talked about today was about evolution of the system. Uh, we're no stranger to that. We see it going. I mean, 50 years ago, there was no EMS system. You know, it, was, it all sort of was born in Vietnam, and here we are today with very sophisticated equipment and trained personnel in the field saving lives. 
So um, my appeal to you today is really to ask for consideration for uh, taking a good look at this 4111 policy statement, which, which creates conflicts for us, and also to consider the future of medical transportation uh, perhaps being in, in better suited for um, jurisdiction under the Department of Health. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the commissioners? Start with Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I would just comment to the last speaker that in my, my former position as legislative counsel, I have heard those arguments before and do understand your concerns. Um, but moving on to the questions um, in terms of uh, looking at our regulations overall for all of, most of you that are at the table, I heard some conversation in the last panel in terms of uh, whether a driver could actually sign up to be serving two or more of the, the uh, TNC companies. And I also heard in this panel today talking about the concern with the traditional taxi cab uh, drivers that their business could be undercut with these T TNC companies coming into service. And with that, um, you know, the number of hours could be cut or, or they may feel that they need to be out there for longer periods of time in order to make a living. So piecing those two together, the concern I have or, or the question I have is I don't believe our regulations actually address the number of hours that an individual could be driving throughout a particular day. And I don't know if that was an issue or that has been an issue that has been under discussion with some of your companies, if maybe that should be something we should be looking at in our regulations. And, and it could come about from some of the concerns with uh, accidents with truck drivers and the length of hours that they've been driving to, you know, throughout a normal course of a day. So has there any, been any discussion on that level in terms of amending our regulations to say a person should not be available to drive uh, for X amount of hours throughout a day? May I? Yes. Um, and I don't know if I'm not familiar with the regulation for PUC, but I know for a fact that in the city of Philadelphia, drivers are not permitted to activate their meter after 12 hours of operation. And therefore, a lot of those personal vehicles that are registered into company names are shared by two or three drivers. So there is no question about full utilization of those vehicles, because by sharing those vehicles, they accomplish few things. First of all, they provide service 24-7. And secondly, because they are able to share their expenses on sharing time and income from operating those vehicles. As far as being open to uh, having few applications, of course we are open to few applications. Of course we would like to utilize uh, UberX demand and Lyft demand and Flywheel demand and all those demand that comes to our dispatchers. However, let's separate two issues. One issue is the insurance of the vehicle. The insurance issue and having few applications of the vehicles are two different things. If you register vehicle into operating company name, who is buying primary commercial insurance. There is no question for financial responsibility at the time of accident. As far as sharing the demand from various uh, suppliers of the uh, demand, we're open to that. It's no, no basic uh, conflict of interest. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Colley. Uh, as I've done earlier, thank you all for making the effort uh, to be here. Uh, we appreciate this input, and it's really quite eye-opening to hear some of the things you've said, uh, not, not the least of which, Mr. Uh, 
Mr. Chagley, uh, uh, your anecdote about your daughter uh, being fearful of giving a bad rating to a TNC driver for fear of retaliatory rating of her. Uh, this very much reminds me of what goes on in any online rating system where you can't get rid of the ratings uh, once they go online. They're there forever, even though it may be simply be a disgruntled employee or a single person who's had a bad experience. Uh, I've heard similar complaints from people who sell on eBay uh, who aren't, aren't paid or the merchandise is returned in poor condition or what have you and the eBay seller refuses uh, or refrains uh, from giving a bad rating to the buyer because the buyer then retaliates with a bad rating which never goes away. Uh, the more I hear about this rating system the more I am suspicious of it uh, particularly when we have been told that the Public Utility Commission is really redundant and there's really no need for us as a complaint forum and, a, and a, an enforcer of regulations because this rating system is uh, a self-regulating system within the industry. And as long as the passengers and drivers rate each other, there's, uh, that's, uh, that'll drive out the bad actors. I'm beginning to think that the rating system uh, is is not only discriminatory but uh, a failure from the get-go and an inadequate protector of the public. Secondly, uh, Mr. Blount, uh, we, we've been told that um, by the the, the, T, the the TNC companies actually enhance the business of taxi cabs and that they don't really put taxi cabs out of business. In, in, in fact, uh, we're told that they, they, they uh, for some reason or another, create more business for the taxi industry. Um, but from, if I understand your, your testimony correctly, uh, you were describing a cream skimming uh, situation where the TNCs are induced to provide service during the peak hours, but don't show up in the off-peak hours, whereas taxi cabs require not only the peak, uh, in fact, they re require the peak revenue in order to serve in the off-peak hours. The implications, I think, are not only uh, uh, bad for the taxi cab industry, uh, but for those who depend on you in the off-peak hours, uh, as well as those who uh, are of an older generation or, or who, are, who are not technologically sophisticated uh, or who are too poor to buy a smartphone in order to call a TNC company. They rely on the telephone to call a taxi cab. But if, if, you, if your industry devolves into a part-time operation, there may not be enough uh, taxi cabs to go around for those who are technologically challenged or too poor for a smartphone. Did I get that right? Am I interpreting that right? Ace in a hole, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not going to dominate the questioning, but uh, I appreciate your input and your testimony, uh, and uh, you can be assured we're going to be taking it into consideration, even though we have also been accused by the uh, certain TNC uh, operators that we are protecting your industry. Uh, never mind that we also have an obligation uh, to protect the public whom you serve. Uh, so uh, thank you for your testimony and for being here. Thank you. Uh, yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Colley. Uh, I would like to add, we are as a cab companies, we are use app as well. Uh, there is a software called uh, GoCabby. It's an, uh, it's an app we use. So we use the app, the same thing. That, I'm sorry. We use an app, the same thing like Uber and, uh, and Lyft as well. Uh, GoCabby use it, we've been using it for a while right now. But again, also like for, we have a list of drivers as a cab companies that we check the criminal records statewide as per the commission. So we really, for the safety of the customers, 
it's good for any company to be under the umbrella of the Public Utility Commission, because if somebody has certain crimes, the, the, the owners of the company and the Public Utility Commission, they come and they ask us for the records for those drivers. Um, so we use the apps and also the list of the drivers, the, any time any enforcement officer can come and check the drivers. And also sometimes, for example, we, the, they, they come and they check the driver record for the driver. Sometimes maybe a driver lost his driver license for not paying a ticket or something. Because of the random inspection by the, by, by the commission, they can come and say, oh, by the way, this guy, his driver license suspended. So, oh, okay, I get my driving record every like two months or three months. Sometimes something slip, but when the commission come or the enforcement come through the random inspection and tell us about that, say, okay, we let this person go or we we'll ask him, you need to get a driving record. For, for the safety of the public, those companies, they need to be under the umbrella of the PUC. The list of the driver, the criminal record that it has to be statewide for all the drivers that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Weber. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to um, just compliment uh, Mr. Salinger, Mr. Saber, and uh, Mr. Ballendorf for actually taking the opportunity to talk about some things that you would suggest need changed rather than just simply criticizing the uh, potential competition. Um, Mr. Bollendorf, I'd like to also let you know that uh, I have an interest in your issue. I spoke directly with Secretary Wolf um, on this, and I, um, our staff and their staff are working, and we think we hope to have a um, positive resolution here for you soon. Thank you. I appreciate that. <clears throat> um, Mr. Salinger mentioned that uh, we don't have enough enforcement officers and also that uh, the insurance is not adequate. Regarding the um, lack of enforcement officers, would you all support uh, an increase in your assessment so that we can um, hire some additional enforcement officers? May I? I think it goes hands in hands because by just increasing number of enforcement officers will not solve the issue. If you identify those TNC, uh, TNC operators I'm with- I'm sorry to interrupt for, for one second, but I'm, I'm just, I think we're talking more broadly here today and not only about TNC. Um, okay. If we're talking broadly, it's, uh, of course, the industry will support it. I feel that the revenue generated by an additional enforcement officer would far offset his, his or her wages. We have not as many as we did 15, 20 years ago. We still have so many illegal operators running this area. And my thought would be give that enforcement officer the right to impound that vehicle, seize it, sell it, and the profits go to the commission to offset his or her wages. There's so many people out there uh, committing violations every day, and I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. We just don't have enough of enforcement. But if we had the enforcement, I feel that they could generate the revenue needed to offset their wages. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmer. Uh, Vice Chairman Coleman. Thank you, Chairman. And again, thank you to all of you who have uh, sat here and endured six hours of testimony. I know I see a couple of familiar faces that were here at the beginning of the day and are here still now. So thank you very much for your time and your commitment. Uh, I think we all view this as a critically important time in the transportation industry. There's really no question what the impetus is for why we are here today. Uh, this is driven by a, a, uh, a revolution in the transportation industry called TNCs. And I would uh, certainly echo my colleagues' comments, Commissioner Colley's comments, um, in that uh, we have been under extreme criticism for doing what I believe is the job of commissioners in the oath that we took uh, to sit here as commissioners in this organization. And that is to protect safety, and that's what it's about. Uh, we recognize that in various parts of the state there is a need. Uh, we've heard that clear from uh, customers, constituents uh, across the state of Pennsylvania that there are 
those that are less than happy with the service that they have received or not received across the state of Pennsylvania, and that's created opportunity. That's created comp a competitive opportunity. So I guess my, my comment today is, uh, at least in, in my view, I don't think that TNCs are going away. I think TNCs are here. I think they're here to stay. And I don't want to be suggesting and prejudicing what we have before us, but I think in just looking at the landscape and, and what is happening with uh, transportation network companies across the United States and indeed around the globe, uh, they will be coming to Pennsylvania and to other jurisdictions, it, it appears, at least at this particular point in time. And the reason I say that is I think that there is an opportunity to Commissioner Whitmer's comment. There is an opportunity for us to modernize what we do in the transportation industry. And I appreciate a number of the comments that were made today in terms of suggestions for change. Uh, I am certainly open, as I believe my colleagues are, to uh, hearing anything even after today. If there's something that you have on your mind that you would like to share with us, I'd certainly like to hear it. You know, the, the, uh, Mr. Sabre, particularly on the, the vehicle age, I think you have a valid point that uh, I recognize that age is not the sole criteria. Uh, I realize that we do have a waiver process and maybe that's an area that we need to take a little bit more time and, and attention with. Uh, some of the tariff issues that have recently come to our attention and how uh, we treat tariff issues as a commission. Again, I am certainly open to uh, dialogue, discussion, suggestions on how we might be able to do better. <coughs> so my, my question for each of you uh, today and, and an offer, the question is, if there are other items that you have not heard mentioned as part of this panel, if there's something you'd like to share with us this afternoon, and the offer is, if you're not comfortable in sharing that in this forum and like to do so afterwards, I'm certainly open and receptive to hearing those comments. So I will leave it to, to each of you uh, if there's something that, uh, that we may have missed today, uh, something that you would like us to focus on. Here's your opportunity. Well, if I may, um, I, I think we really view that we know that TNCs have prompted these kind of meetings and prompted necessary regulatory changes. Uh, and I think those can be addressed in a TNC vacuum. The, the, the mere volume uh, of the regs that, that control the transportation industry would take a, quite a while to kind of sift through and to make sure that you all have everything you need to understand the impact in the smallest corners of the Commonwealth to the biggest cities in the Commonwealth. So uh, it would be our position that I understand you swiftly have to move through this TNC issue and you have to come to some resolution, uh, but to sweep the entire code along with it and try to do that through a pure legislative process rather than kind of the IRC process and getting great input from all corners of the Commonwealth, I, I think would be a mistake for all of us. Uh, so we would just, we understand, but we'd like to have the opportunity. Uh, our members have many issues that we couldn't, couldn't lay out for you here today, but we will provide, you know, with some other information regarding other sections of the code. Thank you. Um, I would just like to add, like, um, Colorado introduced recreational marijuana. Now, that's good for Colorado, but I think the other 49 states are just watching to see what's happening. So this TNC thing, even though there's a lot of pressure being done with it, I think Pennsylvania need to be a little more conservative to see what happens in other states, especially where it started from, in San Francisco, like Chicago, and Boston. I don't think that we should be rushing. Um, as I talked about the history of deregulation, I, I, I'm predicting that this is going to happen here in other places where they try it. So I just think we just need to be a little conservative. And lastly, uh, we, we're going to be working with two tier rules where TNCs are going to be following one set of rules and taxi drivers and numbers are going to be following regulations where we fund the, the regulators. So um, I don't know how fair that's going to be and how that's going to play out as well. Thank you. Make one broad statement, if I might, is that right now the immediate need is a level playing field. You have the rules and regulations in place, and from what I'm understanding from those that have spoken today, what regulatory things you need to change can be done in a period of time, but bring your, these TNCs into compliance with what's already in place. Don't overreact to their social media and pressure from around the, 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 the Commonwealth from people saying, oh, we're not getting the level of service. You, you can get the level of service, and they can provide it on the same 
rules and regulations that are currently in place. They've just chosen not to address those things at this particular point in time. I agree with this statement. I think it's self-prophecy. I think they create this emergency situation by themselves. There is no real threat to the lives of the people, so I would not call it a true emergency situation. On the issue of uh, advanced reservations, TNC is not addressing this issue at all. They cannot provide any advanced reservation on their smartphone. They're right now on demand at this moment service only. Secondly, they do not serve in underprivileged area and those with wheelchair accessible. For example, 215 Get a Cab addresses the issue of selection of the vehicle. You can select sedan, minivan, and wheelchair accessible. It can be served in the underprivileged area with those who just want to place a call, or it can serve to sophisticated student body that can uh, use this uh, smartphone application with ease. So in all that respect, with all this safety concern that comes with the public and safety concern that comes with the drivers, equipping cars with the partitions, uh, safety cameras, and so on. It puts enormous burden and expense on our industry. And TNC is allowed to operate on the radar without all these safeguards in place. It's not going to be a playing field. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chairman. I, I just will conclude. I want to thank you all for participating. Uh, one of the observations I'll make with this panel is I heard many of you use the word deregulated. Um, I remember a speech that a CEO of an energy company came, uh, presented in, in to, to me, and he said, my market, you can use the word deregulated. I like to wor use the word restructured. And the reason he used the word restructured is as a robust retail energy supplier with a generation fleet, he is regulated. And I think what we heard in the panel today is that the commission is looking for a pathway forward in a legislative construct that gets these entities that we are addressing touched by the commission. And what is that? I've heard some of you say, well, they, they, they go out and they operate and they don't play by the rules. Well, I produce a certificate of insurance. I pre-certify my drivers. I pay an assessment to the Public Utility Commission. Is that not regulation? Is that not regulation? And I want to end on that note because that's kind of where this is headed. And I recognize and I, Mr. Blunt, I, I, I hear where you're coming from, but I'm gonna give you some advice. This sea change is coming to the marketplace. It's here, it's disruptive, and it's, you know, but we're dealing with making sure that they play by a set of rules that allow them to invest like you've invested and a, a pathway forward to be regulatory, regu regulatory compliant with, with the state of Pennsylvania, with the State Public Utility Commission. So I step back, I wanna give you all peace of mind. We wanna hear from you. We wanna hear from you though in an innovative mode, not don't touch my sandbox, I'm, I'm, I don't like these guys, I don't want, that's not the reality here. I wrote myself a note. This is like electric restructuring back in 1995. It is, and so here we are today trying to solve a calculus equation that gets these entities regulated in a way that you can continue to do your business and that customers can have peace of mind that they're gonna be operating under the auspices of the Public Utility Commission. And I see a lot of you shaking your heads going, that's, that's fair. Um, and we'll compete against that. That's and customers fair. will have choice. And life will go on and you know, everybody will be able to provide service to customers that want 
a cab when they need it and they want to participate in this Uber app that I have and they want to do that and they'll make a conscious choice. So I commend you for being here, but to the vice chairman's point, I want to make sure that we hear from you if there's other issues outside the TNC world that has given you a little bit of heartburn, how we can modernize our regulatory playbook to help you grow your business here as well. And I think that's a fair um, overture to make here this afternoon, especially with this panel. Mr. Chairman, if I might just follow up on your comments, that the public may file comments with regard to transportation issues at docket number M-2014-2431 until September the 11th at 4 o'clock. You can file those with the Commission Secretary's Bureau.